So welcome to Humanities Day 2012. You guys have probably been making the rounds at this point. And welcome particularly to this special session, which is sponsored by the Master of Arts Program in the Humanities. My name is Hilary Strang. I'm the Deputy Director of MAF, which is what we call it, as some of you know. And my primary job here is to introduce David Ray, who is the Faculty Director of MAF, and is going to talk to you guys about Dante. Um, but I want to say a couple of words first about our master's program um, and to try to link what we do in that program a little bit to the kinds of things that bring people here on Humanities Day generally. Uh, our program was started about 17 years ago and it had two ambitions. One was to make a really great master's program that would help people who are interested in going on to do doctoral work in the humanities get the kind of rigorous preparation that they needed to do that work successfully. But the other aim of the program um, and really, I think the much more important aim of the program was to create a serious place for humanistic inquiry at the University of Chicago where people could do graduate level work who were not interested in going on to do doctoral work, but were interested in finding other ways in which the humanities can come into contact with the world. Um, this is the sort of core aim of MAF. We bring in a rich and diverse class of students every year. We have a class usually of about 115 students. Of those, many will go on to do doctoral study, but many more of our students will go on to work in nonprofits, to become novelists, I say riffing on alumni I happen to see here, to teach at community colleges, uh, to work in social services, to work in the public humanities. Um, and that is the thing that we are, I think, the most proud of and the most excited about in our program that it creates a place for people who have serious interests in the humanities to think about not only what those interests have to do with what you do in school, but also with how those interests can shape your own life outside of school and the lives of other people outside of school. So one of the sort of themes of our program is always how does the intellectual work that we do here in this rarefied place, the University of Chicago, come into contact with the world. Um, and we try to think about that question seriously, we try to think about it rigorously, and we try to think about it in ways that accommodate a wide variety of students. We have students of a really wide range of ages. We are far more diverse than any of the other graduate programs in the humanities at the university. And the reason that we're that diverse is that we're interested in fostering the projects that people really want to do themselves. Uh, that is a serious commitment. That's a difficult commitment at an institution whose watchword is rigor, right? Here at the University of Chicago, the number one thing that you are supposed to do in your work is be rigorous. And there are plenty of people at this school who think, well, how could you be rigorous if you weren't doing academic work? What would it mean to do rigorous work that didn't turn into a dissertation and then an academic monograph? Uh, we believe really strongly that there's all kinds of rigorous and exciting and actually groundbreaking work to be done by thinking through the humanities in different forms, in forms that don't just look like academic papers, that don't just look like dissertations, and in lives that don't just look like becoming professors. Um, we're proud of the ways in which we help our students do that. We offer a great deal of career programming, which is all focused around the idea of how do you take your intellectual interests and turn them into something that you can do in the world? How do you think about how to talk about the kinds of stuff that we do in the academy to people outside of the academy? Uh, we also offer a series of service events that we ask our students to participate in over the course of the year so that they can think about how working with communities of people outside of this institution allow them to fulfill some of the imperatives of humanistic work that brought them to this institution in the first place. Um, and we've just started uh, a journal, an online journal called Colloquium, which I would just recommend to you all to look at because it is wonderful and exciting and represents a great deal of the richness and diversity of our program. Uh, at the center of our efforts to make MAF a place where people do rigorous work that also continues to be in contact with the kinds of problems that drive us to uh, care about the world, uh, at the center of that is a class called Foundations of Interpretive Theory. Um, David and I, together with our colleague Ben Callard, teach that class in the fall. Uh, that class does some things that seem very familiar. We read philosophy, we read theory, we read Hegel, we read the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, we read a lot of Freud, we read a lot of Marx. We read those texts closely and we demand that the students write very rigorous, very focused papers that we call analytic expositions about those texts. Uh, all of that sounds traditional and humanistic, 
But we think of that class as being not only about getting students so that they have read the kinds of things that let them participate in the sorts of conversations that take place at the graduate level in the humanities, but also allowing them to readdress the sorts of questions that brought them to our program in the first place. Uh, one of the things that I love about the material that David is going to talk to you about today and about David's take on it is that David does a version of what he's going to talk to you about today in our theory class. So he brings Dante into this classroom where most of what we're reading is philosophy. And he teaches our students that to read poetry well, you have to read it like it's philosophy. And on the other side, to read philosophy well, you have to be able to think about things like, how does poetry work? Um, I, I don't want to you know, preempt any more of the stuff that David does, because I think you guys will be excited and moved and drawn in by it. Um, but I think that the presence of this poetic text in the midst of our class where we're doing serious philosophical reading uh, is one of the kind of key signs of what our program does, which is to ask people to think differently about what constitutes the humanities and to continue to press themselves on why it is that they want to ask humanistic questions in the first place. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce David Ray, who is a professor in the departments of classics and comparative literature. He teaches students in the college. Uh, he's an advisor, um, a great advisor who forces students to ask rigorous questions but also refuses to allow them to forget that they are also human beings, which is one of the reasons that he's an excellent director for a master's program in the humanities. Uh, he works on poetry and poetics. He's primarily a classicist, um, but as you will see, he's an amazing uh, explicator of all kinds of linguistic problems and interesting things, including uh, Dante's strange, difficult, and very beautiful book, The Vita Nuova. David Ray, I'm going to hand you the microphone. This was a text that I had never taught um, before, uh, before teaching it last year in the core. Um, it has continued to change um, under my eyes as, I, as I've taught it in the core, uh, doing it for the second year now. I got rather obsessed by Dante last year and did what any, you know, uh, self-respecting, I guess, you know, uh, teacher of undergraduates at, at the U of C would, would do. I, I, I hauled off and taught a course, a uh, fundamentals course on the Divine Comedy uh, last year in, in the spring with, with some wonderful undergraduates. And coming back to this text, the, the Vita Nuova, um, it, it looks s still more different to me now after, after that experience. Um, so I have a couple of claims that I make about the, the, the Vita Nuova, and so I want to put some of, some of them out on the table. Um, Dante Alighieri is uh, not just any name, it's not just any cultural signifier. This is, uh, this is, the, this is what's said about Dante in that, in that oracle of cultural signifiers, Wikipedia. <laughs> um, it, 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 Wikipedia knows that Dante was not just a major Italian poet of the Middle Ages, but that he, 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 uh, he wrote what is uh, considered the greatest literary work composed in the Italian language and a masterpiece of world literature, and he's also called the father of the Italian language. Uh, I, love that, I love that phrase. It's a fascinating phrase. The first time I pulled this off Wikipedia, I mean, there, there's a footnote that I didn't get. The footnote said something like, source unknown. Now, the, now they've changed it, and now it says, even the Italian website, ev or even the Italian Wikipedia article on Dante calls, calls Dante the father <laughs> of the Italian language. In, in other words, it's like this sourceless thing circulate. It, 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 now, uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's certainly possible to go back you know, and find very early, very early references to that. But um, Dante is a, a poet who, among other things, made textually the subjectivity uh, that is both featured as a character in, in Dante's Divine Comedy and that also we're being invited to witness in the making in, uh, in this book called the, the Vita Nuova, right? So one way, one way of saying that claim is to say that I think that the Vita Nuova is Dante, or so, some version of Dante, some version of Dante the author, Dante, Dante the poet, Dante the, Dante the dude who got exiled from, from Florence, you know, some, some combination or, 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 or you know, uh, concoction of all of that, saying to us how how I became the poet of the Commedia. That's one way to say it. Another way to say it 
is that we're being given uh, of a very early version of something that might sound very, uh, very postmodern, uh, the idea of uh, a textually produced subjectivity, right? Subjectivity as a textual um, effect. This, this, uh, the, the Vita Nuova is a, is a book that Dante wrote uh, presumably as he was beginning the, the Divine Comedy or perhaps well along the way with it, but it's a kind of um, juxtaposition of two very different sorts of writing. It, alters, it alternates between poetry and prose, and the poems for the most part are poems that Dante had already written, right? and he inserts them into the text and connects them by a kind of poetic autobiography. Right? And uh, he did this by, by a very interesting process of, of selection, um, and as it were, rewrites his life as a life in poetry, and is describing himself uh, becoming a poet by becoming a lover, and recharacterizing his whole existence, birth to death, as subsumed by a devotion to the woman that he calls Beatrice, which is at the same time uh, his, his poetic vocation. Right? It's, it's the same thing. It, it's, it's portrayed as the same thing. Um, so the, the, one of the famous images of, of Dante is from the series of illustrations by Gustave Doré, and this is a, this is a, a picture that illustrates the opening line, the famous opening line of the Commedia, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, in the midpoint of the journey of our life. Uh, I found myself lost in a dark wood, right? And then, and then the rest of the poem portrays a kind of, a kind of pilgrimage. Um, <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of the poem, um, quite some time after, uh, uh, quite some time after Dante has first begun to be guided and led by, by Virgil, um, near the end of, of Purgatory, uh, this is in the, the circle of the, the lustful people, which is where Dante puts all of his poet friends. Um, uh, he says that he's pretty sure that he's going to be among the prideful people, though. That, that's, that's, that's his big worry, because he, he's the best of all poets, and he knows it, and, and that's, that's, that's another issue. But so he encounters here in, in the purgatory um, a, a friend and, and fellow poet called Buona Junta. Uh, I love Longfellow's translation, very interesting, uh, very, very interesting poetic translation. That's why I'm giving it to you. And uh, his poet friend sees him from afar and says, hey, isn't that the guy who wrote that amazing poem called Ladies Who Have <laughs> Intelligence of Love? Right? So he's quoting, the, the Dante is quoting the first line of his own poem. But say if, I, if him I hear behold who forth evoked the new invented rhymes beginning, Ladies That Have Intelligence of Love. So the name of a canzone by Dante. Uh, are you really that amazing poet who did that amazing poem? And, and he says, Dante says, and I to him, Here's, I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm going to tell you exactly who I am, and then you'll know who I am and what it is that I do. One I am who, whenever love doth inspire me, note. And that's what the Italian says, I note, I signify. And in that measure which he within me, which love within me dictates, singing go. In other words, I have fully subjected myself, submitted myself to love. I am taking dictation from love. That's, that's how I live. That's how I write. That's how I do what I do. And, and, the, and the, the fellow poet says, well, now I understand why poetry was so hard for us and we could never write good poetry the, the, the way that you did. And we, we were trying to do what you did, but we couldn't achieve it. Oh, brother, now I see, he said, the knot, which me, the notary, and, and Guitone, so, so three, uh, three other poets, uh, the notary is Guido Guinizelli, who was one of the great theorists of courtly love and the idea of the gentle heart, which held us short, in other words, held us back from the sweet new style that I now hear. So in other words, as Dante is speaking uh, to Buona Junta, Buona Junta is both answering what Dante says as, as sense, and he's also commenting, commenting on it as amazing poetry. He's saying, you're telling me how it is that you've become the poet that you are, and you're exemplifying in your, in your poetry what it is what it is that you describe and how it is that you that you pull that, that you pull it off. So he says, I do perceive full clearly how your pens go closely following after him who dictates, that is love, which with our own forsooth came not to pass. We didn't we didn't achieve that. We other, you know, so-called, so-called poets of love. 
So the Vita Nova traces a kind of biographical arc that begins soon after, or begins in very early childhood and ends, as it were, with, with the expression of a wish that we're being invited to take as the, as the formation of the, of the ambition to make the Divine Comedy happen. So <coughs> the last of the, of the poems uh, he quotes, and he says, after I wrote this sonnet, there came to me a miraculous vision, it's the last vision in this book that's full of amazing visions, in which I saw things that made me resolve to say no more about this blessed one, Beatrice, until I would be capable of writing about her in a nobler way. To achieve this, I am striving as hard as I can. And this she truly knows. Um, she's long since dead at this point. Accordingly, if it be the pleasure of him through whom all things live that my life continue for a few years more, I hope to write of her that which has never been written of any other woman. Right. So, and uh, what it, this, this on the one hand, uh, you know, surface expression of, of, of amorous devotion is at the same time an expression of overweening, you know, thoroughgoing poetic ambition. Uh, uh, my ambition is to make something of a kind that has never been made before. And then it, uh, this is how the, how the book ends. And then may it please the one who is the Lord of graciousness that my soul ascend to behold the glory of its lady. That is, in other words, he's describing what, what happens at the end of the Divine Comedy, right? He's tracing it to its telos. That is, of that blessed Beatrice, Benedetta Beatrice, I have more to say about the etymology of that name, it's really important, who in glory contemplates the countenance of the one who is you know, blessed through, through all ages. So with a, with a gesture that is at once uh, humble and at the same time terrifically arrogant, Dante writes his own love story, not just into the history of poetry, but into Christian theology, which he does even more extremely uh, in the Divine Comedy, where there's this long procession uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a chariot that represents the, the progress of Christianity through, through human history, and when he gets close enough that he can see who's in the chariot, we all think it's going to be Jesus, it's Beatrice riding, riding in the chariot. And she immediately starts schooling him and slapping his wrists and telling him all the things that he's done wrong and how he's still doing things wrong. So one of the, one of the terrifically important things that, that I think Dante is doing in this book and, and, then, and also in the Divine Comedy is... Um, plugging into, uh, reactivating uh, the, the ancient classical and Hellenistic tradition of love as a divinity, right, whose power is cruel and irresistible and in fact uh, omnipotent. It was uh, Virgil who wrote the line, omnia vincit amor, love conquers all things, and it's not good news that, that love conquers all, right? That's spoken by uh, a poet who is dying, and those are his dying words, right? Um, Freud has this, uh, this tradition in mind at a lot of different points in the very first text that we read in the core, the three essays on the theory of sexuality. Uh, <coughs> and when he writes about what he calls perversions, that is to say, uh, versions of sexuality where the sexual aim right, has, has, has veered from so-called normalcy, um, he, want, he points to that as one of the strongest um, evidences of what he calls the omnipotence of love. And he would never have used that phrase if not for this tradition. He's plugging into it through Plato, but also through Roman poetry, through Virgil and the elegiac poets. So, so Freud says, and by the time we read uh, Dante's Vita Nuova, we've read this in the core, it's perhaps in connection precisely with the most repulsive perversions. He's talked about feces licking, you know, with, with great gusto. That the mental factor must be regarded as playing its largest part in the transformation of the sexual instinct. It is impossible to deny that in their case, a piece of mental work has been performed which in spite of its horrifying result, is the equivalent of an idealization of the instinct. That's not a bad description of, of what it is that, that Dante is representing, this kind of alchemy that, that he's describing happening in this fictionalized subjectivity, an idealization of an instinct. The omnipotence of love is perhaps never more strongly proved than in such aberrations as these. The highest and the lowest are always closest to each other in the sphere of sexuality. And Freud being Freud, when, when he wants you know, to, to, put a, to put a stamp of high culture authority 
on, uh, on what he says. He, of course, has to quote uh, Goethe's Faust. But it's Goethe, quote, uh, Goethe in Faust making his own Faust look and sound like a rewrite of the divine comedy in reverse, from heaven through the world down to hell. Right. This, this image by Caravaggio, I think, uh, is, is important because um, I, I recently gave a, a, a talk to some Latin teachers about the, the sway of love, and I wanted to show some, some really wonderful pop culture images. I, I found Amor Vincit Omnia tattooed on people's arms. I found a version of it in English, Love Conquers All, on this thing that looks like a handbag, but it's actually a Bible cover, and it's got little birds and flowers all over it. But it's important to remember that the ancient, the ancient meaning of love conquers all is represented by something like this, right? This uh, terrifying, sort of criminally mischievous boy with the scary black wings. And what this boy has done here, you see, is he's just finished amusing himself by stomping on things that represent all the highest human pursuits military strategy, music, the, 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 the building arts, some other things that, that, that we can't see. And he's, he's delighting himself in having uh, brought to ruination right, the, the finest and highest uh, intellectual and, and, uh, and, and, and emotional, well, I, I guess I would say intellectual and cultural products of, of humanity. Um, the image, the, the Caravaggio, um, the, the, the posture is thought to be a visual echo of Michelangelo's sculpture, which is called Victory and is thought to be maybe for the tomb of Pope Julius II, but it's also, it, it, it also seems to be a portrayal of the same thing. There's this aged, uh, aged uh, sensibility, this aged subjectivity that is beset by this youthful figure looking like the, looking like the love god. Okay, um, let's see, how many of these do I really want to talk about? I'm, I'm not going to read these, I'm just going to show you these. This is an example from the Roman poet Propertius of love. Uh, this is the very, it's the very opening of his poem collection. It's an image of love, you know, taking the poet, capturing him, and instantly enslaving him the moment that he sees the beloved, and stomping on his head, right? Love uh, pressed my head down with his crushing feet. And the feet represent both the feet of love, but also the metrical pattern of, of the poem, right? The, you know, you know what, what a metrical foot is. Uh, Roman elegiac poetry is recognizable instantly as soon as you see the second line. The second line is shorter, and it's a five-beat line. Uh, and once you see that, you know that you're not reading manly epic. You're reading wilting, wussy, you know, drained, effeminate uh, love poetry. That's, that's the ancient convention, and the ancient poets all play on it. Uh, the first place where we see love stomping on, on heads is, is in uh, Plato's Symposium. Oh, I see that my, uh, my autocorrect changed <laughs> Agathon to Agatha. Never mind, but that's, a, that's Agathon's speech. Uh, yeah, Agathon's speech, not Agatha Christie. Um, so love there is stomping on our skulls. Love, on the one hand, is, is delightfully tender and sweet, but the way he stays so delightfully tender and sweet is that instead of, instead of walking on the ground with his bare foot, uh, he gets from place to place by stomping on our skulls and brains. Right. Okay, so the beginning of the Vita Nuova. There's a kind of play of mirrors in the opening. Uh, um, what, what does it mean to be a book? What kinds of things are a book? Um, in Dante's world, in Dante's analogical, uh, allegorical world, one thing that's the book that is a book is the whole world, right? Creation is a book, and it can be read in all, dif in all the different senses that Scripture can be read, right? It can be read literally, it can be read allegorically, it can be read anagogically, that is to say, I can look to it to find out how I should live my life. But my memory is also a book, right? And for Dante, my memory is a, is a book, and if, if, I, if I read the, the, the book of my memory, Dante says, I get to a place that is the beginning of the Vita Nuova, right? So that the book that you, O oh reader, hold in your hands is, is, being, is being described as a representation of the memory itself, that is the subjective memory, of which this book then claims to be taking um, faithful dictation. In the part of the book of my memory before which little could be read, there comes a chapter with the rubric, A New Life Begins, Incipit Vita Nova. And Incipit, still in English, right, is the name for the beginning of a new section, a new paragraph. 
It's my intention to copy into this little book the words I find written under that heading, if not all of them, then at least the essence of their meaning. And he goes, so th this, he says, is my earliest memory. And it's, it's, it's as if we've got him stretched out on the couch, right? And he's telling the doctor sitting behind him, my, my earliest memory, or my earliest significant memory goes like this, doctor. Nine times already since my birth, the heaven of light had circled back to almost the same point, so nine solar returns, nine years, when there appeared before my eyes the now glorious lady of my mind. Per perhaps that now glorious is the first announcement that Beatrice is already dead, that she's already been translated to another plane by the, by the time he reads this. And perhaps the phrase, lady of my mind, is already announcement, an announcement that Beatrice, just like Dante in this book, is a mental creation, right? In addition to being a character, it is also being, uh, being put forward as a mental, a mental creation, and the fictionality of both characters, we might say, are, are already being put forward. This lady who was called Beatrice, even by those who did not know what her name was. What could that possibly mean? I'll say more about that in a minute. She had been in this life long enough for the heaven of the fixed stars to be able to move a twelfth of, the, of a degree to the east. In other words, she was nine too, if you do the math, in her time. That is, he, he, he resolves it, he doesn't expect you to, to do the math. She appeared to me at about uh, the beginning of her ninth year, and I first saw her near the end of my ninth year year. What's so special about nine? He has a chapter devoted to the number nine. Well, nine is three squared, and what's so special about three? Well, he says the Holy Trinity, but the real reason, of course, is that, is that three is the generative number of the divine comedy, right? Dante has, in a sense, re rewritten the cosmos, right, through, his, through the terza rima form of the divine comedy. She appeared dressed in the most patrician of colors, a subdued and decorous crimson, her robe bound round and adorned in a style suitable to her years. Okay, so what's, what's up with this phrase, uh, the, the glorious lady of, the now glorious lady of my mind who was called Beatrice, even by those who did not know what her name was. What would it mean if I saw someone and I didn't know their name, but I called her Beatrice? What, what would that mean? Because that is what he's claiming. It would mean something like this. Uh, by the way, Dante did fall madly in love in, in, in his life, a, a passionate mad love that he never got over, namely with philosophy. He talks about uh, reading Aristotle and, and Cicero and reading so much uh, in the evening that he would come out and look at the stars and they, they, seemed, they seemed to be wobbling around in the sky because his eyes were so bleary from, from reading. Aristotle and, and Aquinas right, are, are thinkers without which Dante would never have produced the, the, the body of poetry that he did. And one of the things that the Vita Nova is doing is reworking his earlier pre-philosophical poetry into a philosophical system. So, what does Aristotle say at the beginning of the, the Nicomachean Ethics? If I want to study ethics in the ancient sense, I got to start with moral psychology. That is to say, not what I ought to do, but rather what people actually do. That is, rather, that is to say, how, how it is that human beings are motivated to do the things that they do. And how are they motivated, says Aristotle? Every art, every action, every pursuit, every decision is thought to aim at some good. That's the structure of a good, of the good. It's structured as a goal. That's, that's what the good is. We're talking about the beneficial good, not the moral good. And an, a human action, in order to be an action, has got to have a telos, which is its good. That's what structures it. For this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. Much later, he says, or a few sections, he says, if then there is some end of the things we do, where end means goal, where, where it means the good of something, which we desire for its own sake, everything else being desired for the sake of it, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, uh, and Aristotle doesn't think that that's possible, he doesn't believe that there could be an, inf an infinite regress because the process would go on to infinity, so our desire would be empty and vain. Thank you, Lacan. Uh, clearly, this, this end aim, must be the good and it must be the chief good. So Aristotle insists that every action has its good that structures it as its goal. He further insists that there's a hierarchy of aims. He further exists that there is a chief good at the top of that, of that hierarchy of ends. Uh, and he says, he says, look, 
Everybody in my culture, I don't know about yours, but, uh, but as an ancient Greek, he says, in my culture, both ordinary people, both the general run of, of, of human beings and people of superior refinement, all say that the highest good is happiness. He says, that's not a claim, that's a definition. That happiness, by definition, in this ancient way of thinking, is, uh, is the highest good. What's, what's this got to do with Beatrice? Well, happiness in Greek is eudaimonia, hence the name of the... Uh, of, of eudaimonism, uh, kind of, uh, 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 which is a, a way of characterizing uh, Aristotelian and other kinds of philosophy. It was uh, Kant who coined the, the term eudaimonist philosophy, and he was, he was not, uh, not in the least friendly towards eudaimonism. He, did, he didn't think that happiness was a good idea, at least not in this sense. Going after happiness was not a good idea. It didn't sound very moral to him. Um, and eudaimonia, uh, happiness, the, the kind of happiness that makes a life fully choice-worthy and optimal in its functioning and therefore worth living. That's the kind of happiness we're talking about, not happiness as a feeling, is in Latin, beatitudo. <coughs> Cicero and Seneca wouldn't have translated it that way. They would have said beata vita. But by the time you get to, for example, Boethius, and then after that in, in medieval Latin, it's always translated as beatitudo. A beator would be somebody who has the power to make someone else happy. Make it feminine, it's a Beatrix. Beatrice means she who has the power to render someone in the state of that which is the highest human happiness by definition. That was really her name, right? There, she was this, there was really this, 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 this girl named Bice. They all went by nicknames. Dante was a nickname. He was really Durante. But there was this woman named Bice Portinari. You know, uh, she was the daughter of a banker. She married a, a, a banker. Not, certainly not Dante. Dan, Dante married a, a banker's daughter, had, had four kids, got exiled. Uh, you know, uh, we don't know whether, you know, he ex we don't know how many dozens of words he exchanged with this woman called Bice Portinari and what her relation to the Beatrice character, you know, of, of Dante's writing might be. But what Dante is insisting on from, from the very get-go is that her name is, is absolutely truthful in its meaning and, and, its, and its etymology. And, and he's going to stick to that, right, all the way through the rest of his poetic career. Beatrice will accompany him all the way up at the, to, to the end of the paradise where they're in this kind of amphitheater and all enjoying the, the beatific vision, which is the, the, the theological name for the, for the vision of the divine that renders the human soul you know, eternally happy, the beatific vision. But they're also in this kind of you know, uh, pre-modern panopticon where not only can they all see God, they can all see each other. So Dante can always see his Beatrice, right, through, throughout eternity at, at the end of the, of the Commedia. Okay, all right. <coughs> so that's, that's the first memory. The second memory that Dante describes happened, you guessed it, nine years later. They're, they're, not, they're uh, 18 now. Nine times already since uh, my birth, the heaven of light had circled back to almost the same... Uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry. I'm, um, I've already done that. I want something else. Yeah, so, no, I'm, never mind. I'm not going on to the age 18 yet. I'm sticking with the, the age nine. I'm sticking with this first, this first sighting still. The next thing that Dante does for us is he offers a kind of psychoanalysis of his experience of, of, the, of the first sighting of Beatrice. Why do I call it a, a, psychoanalyst, a psychoanalysis? Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, Freud was by no means the first thinker to divide the soul into parts, the human psyche into parts, right? Plato already does it in the Republic. He divides it into, into three. And Plato has a, uh, a set of philosophical theories about why the soul has to be in parts. And it's a, it's a theory that sounds rather, rather close to what, to what Freud is going to insist on. The reason my soul has got to have parts is that I've got these conflicting desires and I can feel inside me uh, on the one hand the impulse to do something and on the, other, on the other hand the impulse not to do the same thing. Right? So the system that Dante is working with, with here is, is the, the, uh, the system of Galen which was uh, a medical division of the soul into, into three parts, three different kinds of spirit. So the middle one is the vital spirit that dwells in the secret chamber of the heart so the, 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 the region of the affect, or what, what the Greeks call thumos, the, the, the spirit. And that part, he said, 
began to tremble so violently that even the most minute veins of my body were strangely affected, and trembling, it spoke these words. So the vital spirit, the heart, the, the heart spirit, said the following words, Look, a God more powerful than me who will come and be my master. So the vital spirit, the heart spirit, you know, doesn't have, doesn't have ocular vision. All that it can perceive is amor. All that it can perceive is this feeling that is coming over the subjectivity, and it immediately identifies it, it immediately recognizes it in the terms of this ancient tradition. Ah, a god. Notice, notice how uh, comfortable Dante is throughout, I mean, here and throughout his writing, sort of toggling between pagan and Christian uh, image, images, uh, images and uh, cultural systems. Toggling isn't even the right word because he's, he's operating with both of the systems at the same time. So that's what the vital spirits say. Um, here's what the animal spirit says. And uh, you know, uh, economists uh, since, since Keynes have used this word sometimes, animal spirits, but I, I think that the original meaning of it is a little different. It means psychic pneuma. That, so animal is a translation of the word psychic and this is the intellective faculty, the one abiding in the high chamber to which all the senses bring their perceptions. This part was stricken with amazement, and speaking directly to the spirits of sight, said these words, Now your beatitudo has appeared. You have now perceived through vision, O spirits of sight, that thing which is, which, which has the power uh, to put you in possession of the highest human good. And finally, uh, you've got to have the, the, the comic moment, right? The natural spirit, the one dwelling in the part where our food is digested, the, the, the low part says, began to weep, and weeping said these words, I'm screwed. <laughs> Hell miser quia frequenter impeditus ero de inceps. Woe is wretched me, for henceforth I shall often be impeded. I'm not going to sleep well. I'm not going to eat well. I'm going to start acting like a scraggly lover and living in a you know, disorderly way. I'm go I guess I'm going to have to become poet. Right. Um, so he says, let me say that from that time on love governed my soul, which became immediately devoted to him. The Italian says which became espoused to him. Right? The soul becomes the wife of, uh, of love. And he reigned over me. He lorded over me with such assurance and lordship given him by the power of my imagination. Really interesting, right? On the one hand, love had the total power over me, but on the other hand, it was my imagination. Uh, that gave him the power that I could only dedicate myself to fulfilling his every pleasure. Um, I'm not going to read through all the all the rest of the the passages that I give you, but I just want to I want to trace a couple of things that happen through this book because I, I have a, a next set of of series of of, of claims um, about this book that I that I develop in in lecture, and one of them goes like this. Um, Dante really is portraying this poetic autobiography as a kind of apprenticeship, a kind of self-imposed apprenticeship to love that changes the nature of, of his desire, we could say, and thereby changes the nature of his poetic project. So the first thing that happens uh, or his next interaction with Beatrice is when her sweet greeting, her, uh, her salute, uh, dolcissimo salutare, her sweetest greeting came to me. And he describes going into an ecstasy, right? He immediately gets high off the experience of being greeted by Beatrice. Uh, I, was, I was talking uh, uh, about Freud on the, on the perversions and Freud defines uh, the perversion as sex, sexual, a sexuality where, where some other aim has been, um, has been substituted. Okay, so what, what is happening here is in a certain sense, in a certain sense, sense fits Freud's definition. Uh, it's impressive on the one hand, but, but on the other hand, it's, a, it's as Dante portrays it, it's a... Um, it's a kind of developmental stage, and the risk is that he's going to stay at that stage. Uh, he talks to, to us about, you know, trying to f put himself in the place where she's going to be and getting all excited, she's going to greet me, it's going to happen, it's going to, and, and then sort of running off, you know, to, to, to keep to himself, to, to keep close to his heart 
this experience of being greeted. If you've read uh, Proust, uh, little Marcel is just like that with his mother's kiss. Uh, at, at the beginning of that, of that novel, it becomes totally ritualized and he has all these anxiety attacks if, if, there are, uh, if there are company over because he might not get his kiss. And once he gets the kiss, you know, he tries to hold it really, you know, hold it very carefully and run upstairs and, and, and get in bed. Dante has become like that in regard to, in regard to the greeting. And then, horrible thing happens. Um, by the way, Dante kind of flaunts the, 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 the fictionality uh, of, of, his, of his book by, by dropping little hints that really he was living this entirely other life. There were other women that he, w that he was writing poetry to. Um, uh, and and makes it, the book makes it clear that he's, that he's recharacterizing his whole life as centered around Beatrice. But he tells us that, 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 uh, that what happens is um, after he had uh, taken certain liberties in, in poems that he was writing about uh, an altogether different lady, whom he calls a screen lady for his real love for Beatrice, he says, uh, many people commented on it more than courtesy would have permitted, and this often caused me grave concern, and so I became, uh, you know, uh, somewhat, my, my, uh, my reputation became somewhat undermined, and of course, because of that, my most gracious lady, the scourge of all vices and queen of the virtues, passing along a certain way, denied me her most sweet greeting in which lay all my bliss. So now I have been, as it were, expelled from the garden, Dante says, uh, and I am, I'm in a certain, uh, 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 in a terrible bind. Something is going to have to give. And he says, well, now, now that I'm, now that I'm, uh, you know, uh, out, now that I'm out of luck, in, in, in reg now that I'm no longer, I no longer have access, to this thing that has become my aim, I want to stop, he says, and say something about the miraculous effect. I want to, I want to explain how virtuosamente operava. That is the language of Catholic sacramental theology, right? I mean, uh, a Catholic sacrament is by definition something that effects, that is, produces the thing that it signifies. It's like money, right? If I lose fi a, a five dollar, the five dollar bill represents money, but it really is the money. If you give one to me, you know, you haven't just given me a picture of it, you've really given me the five dollars. Same, same way for the, for the greeting. What is it to greet somebody, after all? He says, you know, whenever, whenever this is the thing about, you know, uh, in ad anticipation of her miraculous uh, greeting, I would, uh, my, my face all became lit up, and if you looked at it, you would simply see, you would simply see love. But what does it mean to greet somebody? Salute is one of the words that Dante uses for greeting. So it's the same as the English word salutation. Uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the root words in Latin, salus, means wholeness, being safe and sound. It's the root of the word salvation. But, but long before Christian salvation theology, right, the word salvus in, in Latin has the sense of safe and sound and whole. So in other words, on this way of thinking, when I greet you, I am saying, may you be safe and sound, may you be whole, may you be integrated, right? You know, may, may you be happy, right? So in other words, Dante is saying that when ordinary people greet each other, it's, it's, it's a nice wish. When Beatrice greeted me, it actually worked. It actually did what a greeting is, is a wish to do. It actually put me in that state of, of bliss that, um, that a greeting wishes on other people. Okay. So there's a kind of crisis that happens, a kind of poetic crisis that happens that transforms Dante. And it happens at this, you know, they're at a friend's house. Dante really, really almost loses it. He almost passes out. He crashes into a wall. He writes these, these weird poems where walls are, are, are yelling at him, die, die, and crazy stuff is happening because he's, 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 he's losing it. Um, but something gives, something changes. And it changes, I would say, right in this scene that is a kind of scene of, of, of uh, poetic initiation, but it's also very much like a Socratic elenchos. It's very much like what happens in a Socratic dialogue where Socrates refutes somebody, not by saying, you know, you're wrong, I'm right and you're wrong, but rather, so let's see, you said this, 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 and this. Do you really think the things that you said that you, that you thought at, at the beginning? And the answer might turn out to be no. So, 
Um, so these, gr these, these girls are like muses, very much like muses. They're mean girls, like the, like the, like the mean muses in, in Hesiod. Dante loves to be schooled by mean girls all, all through his career. Because of my appearance, many people had learned the secret of my heart. And certain ladies who had seen me swoon at one time or another and who knew my heart very well happened to be gathered together one day enjoying each other's company when, as if guided by fortune, uh, I passed by near them and heard one of these gentlewomen, gentlewomen call to me. The lady who had addressed me had a very lively way of speaking, and so when I had come up to them and saw that my most gracious lady was not with them, gaining confidence, I greeted them and asked what I could do to please them. There were many ladies present. Several were laughing together. Others were looking at me as if waiting for me to say something. There were others talking among themselves, one of whom, turning her eyes toward me and calling me by my name, said, Why do you love this lady of yours if you are unable to endure the sight of her? Tell us, for surely the goal of such a love must be strange indeed. It's as if this woman has read the three essays on, on, on the theory of sexuality. She says, you, you, You've got a really strange sexual aim, and I'm trying to figure out what it, what it is. After she had said these words, not only she but the others showed by their expression that they were waiting for my answer. So that they're, they're not, they're not going to stop until Dante gives an answer. Um, ah, yeah, just there's that. But back to uh, all good, all good. But back to that. Back to Dante. You, you, got, you got my point about the Freud. I said, ladies, the goal of my love once consisted in receiving the greeting of this lady uh, to whom you are perhaps referring. And this greeting... And in this greeting rested the bliss which was the goal of all my desires. But since it pleased her to deny me, my Lord, love, through his grace, has placed all my bliss in something that cannot fail me. Something has changed in me because the, the, the thing that I take as my, as my end aim, my highest good, the, the thing that I'm counting on to deliver beatitudo to me has changed. With this, the ladies began to speak among themselves. And just as sometimes... Here, this wonderful simile, like it's, it's like out of an epic poem, right? It's like out of Homer. The rain can be seen falling mingled with beautiful flakes of snow. So did I seem to hear their words issuing forth mingled with sighs. After they had spoken to each other for a while, the one who had first addressed me spoke to me again saying, we beg you to tell us where this bliss of yours now rests. You say you've changed your delivery system of bliss. What's the new one? And I answered her, in those words that praise my lady. In other words, I have now become a different kind of poet. I have become a, pri a, a praise poet. That's what I've become. They're not convinced, they say. And the one who asked me the question said, if you're telling us the truth, here's the Socratic Alenkos, then those words you address to her describing your condition, the, po the poems that you've been writing lately, must have been written with some other intention because, in other words, she's saying, I'm, I'm reading your, your recent poetry and you are still the same whiny love poet, you know, that you were at the beginning of this book. So you say, you say that your aim has changed. Then I, shamed by her words, in the stuff I didn't show you of Freud, Freud talks about shame being one of the motive for forces, not just for repression, but also for sublimation. I departed from these ladies saying to myself, since there is so much bliss in words that praise my lady, why have I ever written in any other way? Right? A moment of encounter in which this represented subjectivity uh, makes a, a, a life-changing decision to become a different kind of poet. Therefore, I resolved that from then on I would always choose as the theme of my poetry whatever would be in praise of this most gracious one. Then reflecting more on this, it seemed to me that I had undertaken a theme too lofty for myself so that I did not dare to begin writing and I remained for several days with a desire to write and the fear of beginning. It's a familiar, familiar experience to any math student. But then something happened. Then it happened that while walking down a path along which ran a very clear stream, I suddenly felt a great desire to write a poem and I, had, I began to think about, think how I would go about it. It seemed to me that to speak of my lady would not be becoming unless I were to address my words to ladies. And not just to any ladies, but only to those who are worthy, not merely to women. Then I must tell you, my tongue, as if moved of its own accord, spoke and said these words, ladies that have intelligence of love. That is to say, the first line of the poem that Buona Junta in, in Purgatory is going to quote you know, uh, all, all those years later when he sees Dante coming from a distance and says, hey, aren't you that poet that wrote that amazing poem, ladies that have intelligence of love? 
intelligence of love. And he said, well, yes, I am. And this is, this is how I did it. I did it by taking <coughs> love's dictation and, and being that true, that true to, uh, that true to him, um, that true, that true to, the, to the power of love. Um, let's see. <coughs> um, the, and there, there really is a, a, a marked change in the tone, uh, in the tone of the poems. Um, uh, you know what? There's one that I want to share with you, and I, I, I can't find it, so I'm just going to say it, I think. I, I think. I have to say it in Italian and then translate it. Tanto gentile, tanto nesta, pare la donna mia, quando altrui saluta. So honorable and so so gracious seems my lady when she greets someone. So the experience of being greeted by the lady has now been generalized, universalized, it's, it's been classicized and become something that any human being can step, in, can step into. Cogni lingua deve tremando muta e gli occhi non ardiscono di guardare. That every tongue becomes trembling mute and the eyes don't dare to look at her. Ella si va, sentendosi laudare benignamente d'umiltà vestuta. On she goes, uh, kindly clad in humility uh, and experiencing that she's being praised. E par che sia una cosa venuta da cielo in terra a miracol mostrare. And it seems that she is something that has come from heaven to earth to make the miraculous appear. Mostrasi si piacente a chi la mira, che dà per gli occhi una dolcezza al core che intender non la può chi non la prova. Um, um, <coughs> she, she gives uh, uh, such a sweetness through the eyes that it cannot be understood, it cannot be comprehended except by one who experiences it. Only, only, so in other words, Beatrice has really become, among other things, a kind of um, objective correlative of Dante's poetry, right? The sweetness of her greeting and the sweetness of her procession through, through the street and being praised is both the object of the praise, but it's also an enactment of, of the, the, the poetry itself. But the poem's not done. E par che dalla sua labbia si mova un spirito suave pien d'amore che va dicendo all'anima sospira. And it seems that there comes, there, there emanates from her mouth a spirito, a spirit, a breath full of love, bulging with love, that keeps saying to the, to the mind, that keeps uttering the following command to the mind, sigh, right? So that the, the, the sigh of admiration uh, has completely, um, um, has, has become completely fused with the noble, uh, pure, uh, calm diction of, of praise, uh, the tone to which Dante has hoisted, hoisted his, his poetry, right? So it's still lyric love poetry, but it has achieved the kind of poise that will allow him to become just enough of a narrative epic poet uh, to, to make the, the Divine Comedy. Thanks for your attention.